Celebrating 12 years of possibility. Pilot Flying J and Halloran Hilton Hill present Anything is Possible. Today's guest, Kim Williams, Part 1. Welcome to Anything is Possible. This is Haller and Hilton Hill, and I've got another great story of possibility. These are great stories about great people whose lives prove that anything is possible, and I have been looking forward to this interview right here. One of my songwriting heroes is in the building. Kim Williams, welcome to Anything is Possible. Thank you so much, Haller, and uh, it's, uh, I appreciate you inviting me. When, when I look at you, and I guess when anybody looks at you, does it bother that they look twice? No. No, not, not if it's special if it's somebody I don't know. And, and after I know people, they don't look twice. They just don't, they kind of accept me. And, uh, and that's fine. I, I, I wrote a song with a, with a good friend of mine, and he came up with the hook. The guy that I wrote Three Wooden Crosses with, Doug Johnson, was telling people, I didn't realize it, but he was telling people in Nashville when they'd talk about me. He would say, uh, "He ain't pretty, but he's beautiful." Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we wrote the song. We had it, got it cut too, but but I but I think most people see through that. And Garth does. He says, "You know, once you meet him, you, you you just don't see that anymore. It just disappears. You don't think about the scars." And and uh, I think that's the way most of my friends are. And if they're not my friends, it don't matter anyway. <laughs> You know, uh, let, let's talk about this first before we before we get into that story. Just tick off from me because you've had some hits. You wrote a lot of stuff for Garth Brooks and many others. Yeah. You've won awards. You yeah. you're in the Hall of Fame. Um, kind of run through some of the big hits. Well, some of the big ones. Uh, probably the two biggest is "Ain't Going Down." Garth Brooks was was a huge number one for me. Uh, Three Wooden Crosses, Brandy Travis won every award that you can win in country and gospel because wow. it started out on a gospel album and crossed over to country and went one in both genres. So it won it all. But but uh, Papa Love Mama, crazy, uh, I call it the homicidal truck driver song. <laughs> uh, uh, Reba McIntyre, uh, uh, The Heart is Lonely Hunter, which is an old title of a book that I appropriated. and. Uh, uh, just, well, I've had uh, 16 number ones, uh, uh, and it's been it's been a great career. She's going to make it, but Garth Brooks was the number one. Wow! And uh, and then we had another on him called Midnight Cinderella. Uh, I had four on Garth, and uh, uh, and just a real spread. I've I've been real lucky. I've had them in movies, a George Strait movie. Uh, I had a song in Pure Country. Uh, uh, a movie called Cadillac Ranch. I had one in, and 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 there's supposed to be a movie made on uh, Three Wooden Crosses. The ladies that did all the writing and producing for Touched by an Angel have paid for the rights of that song ever since it was a hit. And now, uh, the last time I talked to Marcy Gold, who's the assistant of uh, uh, the lady that does the script writing, uh, says that by the end of this year, the first next year is going into production. So. Look how blessed you so are. I, oh yeah, I've been I've been uh, really really blessed, and I could not have been dropped in Nashville at a better time. About eighty five, eighty six, I really started going after it, and uh, uh, and I was writing with all these people, Halloran. I mean, uh, Doug Stone, uh, Garth Brooks, uh, and some of my friends were writing with Alan Jackson. All these guys were new demo singers, and we were. We were just writing with them because they could sing good and we'd go do the demos. And, and all of a sudden, we are in the middle of a boom because it just kind of changed. And they, they went to younger artists. And uh, so the Joe Dippies, you know, and, and we were writing with all of them. So I just kind of uh, timing, luck, timing, destiny, whatever you want to call it. I was, I was very lucky, I think. You know, uh, as I've kind of followed your career and followed your work, there's so much joy. You love the craft of songwriting. I do. You love it passionately. Yeah. And I was talking to you as I was driving down the road a couple of weeks ago, and we got off into Everywhere. these other philosophical conversations. Yeah. yeah. But I totally understood that because great songwriters are great observers of and absorbers of and regurgitators of That's life. it. That's it. 
We're I, interested I read, in everything. I read everything. I mean, I literally read. I don't watch a lot of TV. Now, specific TV, I will if I know where it's at and when it's on. And, 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 and a few times, I watch the walls, <laughs> of course. But, <laughs> but, but I don't watch TV. But, uh, but I do absorb and I listen to people's conversations. And, uh, and you pay attention. Yeah, I mean, like, yeah. like my brother-in-law was, uh, and and uh, and a sister were there. And, and he was having a, a few extra glasses of wine, and she said, "What are you drinking so much for?" And she said, "I thought your back was hurting." He said, "Well, it only hurts when I quit drinking." Well, we wrote it. <laughs> <You know? laughs> it's a great song. That's a great country song. Yeah, it only hurts when I quit drinking. Why don't we take a break and we'll get back to your okay. story—a story of great possibility. This is Kim Williams. You're watching Anything Is Possible. We'll be right back. Possibility powered by Pilot Flying J, Covenant Health, Home Federal and the Knoxville News Sentinel. Coming up. You know, for about the first minute, it was pure uh, hell. I mean, as close as I've ever been to it. Welcome back to Anything Is Possible. Master songwriter, lover of life. <laughs> Kim Williams is with me on Anything Is Possible. Thank you for joining us. Oh, thank you for having me, Helen. Thank you. Let's talk about what happened to you. Well, uh, I was... And, be, and before you answer that question, yeah. would you tell me what mental process you went through just then before you hit your start point for the story? What, what were well, you thinking? Well, right I there? was thinking, what I was thinking, you said lover of life. And, and I've been reading about a book that I read that it was called Life After Life. And uh, about pe about someone that died several times, or or, or should have been dead, but they kind of come back. And uh, and that's kind of what I thought. You said lover of life, and I, I thought lover of lives, because I think about four times I should have been gone in this world. And uh, the burns was one. One was when I was being operated on for a knee replacement, and almost bled out, and I uh, had an automobile accident and that should have killed me. I mean, there wasn't much left of the vehicle. And uh, then not uh, January, I had cellulitis in hospital 10 days, and, and it's very close. I mean, the doctor said, it's, you know, very close to losing me a couple How'd times. you get burned? I got burned uh, in a factory accident in 1974. Uh, I worked at a glass manufacturing uh, facility uh, in uh, Churchill, Tennessee, I think this is its location, and uh, it's the address, but anyway, I uh, was an instrument technician, and they'd put in a new process line called float glass, where they float it on a uh, liquid tin, and to keep so they don't have to polish either side, it comes out ready, just like it is. And it was all new to us. It's kind of a British uh, uh, invention, I think. And they, I know they had a lot of British uh, English guys over overseeing it. But anyway, we were starting the line up, and and they sent me down to check on this. Uh, well, the foreman come and got me to, uh, and we, to check on this, this SCR control panel. And that's this fancy term for an electronic control panel for a, for a glass heater that would heat the, heat the glass up after the, it came out of the furnace, where it would anneal it. And, but anyway, I, we were working on that panel, my foreman looking over my shoulder and we were working on it. And most of those panels, when you open them up, are, uh, it kills, uh, the secondary, and your, and your primary that feeds in is covered, it's safe, but these panels weren't safe, the, the primary was open, and we didn't know that. But anyway, we got when I got in there to change the SCR, I got into the voltage, and, uh, and it got onto my uh, optic nerves. Thank God I had safety glasses on, because it blew when it blew. All of you picture a high voltage arcing out, it was a huge and caught my clothes on fire and burned my form in red and my, and my most of my fire was a clothing fire, it burned the clothes because I was, I was blind. I didn't really know what was happening. I just knew it was hot. And uh, so anyway, it was an industrial accident. And, so uh, how long did it take you to, to heal up and do you remember what it felt like? Oh God, well, you know, for about the first minute it was pure uh, hell. I mean, as close as I, ever been to it, but then it quit. It's like uh, uh, the shock uh, breaker that God puts in all of us shut off. And 
And I was burned twice worse than my foreman, but he was an older man. They put him on a stretcher, and I walked into the ambulance and sat down, or the, uh, the emergency vehicle, and sat down on a wheel well. But I could look in the mirror, and there was pieces of flesh hanging off of him, and I thought, I can't be hurt very bad. I don't feel nothing. But it was that that, yeah. that circuit breaker had just shut off. And, uh, and you could see? I could see the pieces of flesh hanging off of me, but I thought, well, you know, it can't be bad. I'm not hurting. Although I did hurt, you know, for like a minute and a half until it shut off. And uh, uh, so when I, and I really didn't realize how bad it was hurt until we went, we pulled into the hospital in Kingsport, Tennessee. And I walked into the emergency room and, and, and nurses, you know, are trained to handle trauma. And they all just went, they flipped out. And that scared me because <laughs> I knew they were trained not to flip out. And uh, so anyway, it was a, uh, it was a. Uh, How long it, did it take? So you've had lots of skin grafts. Yeah. And they had to put you back together. Yeah, I had, I had, uh, I was in, I was not out of the hospital for six months, three different hospitals. And, and, and I spent a lot of time in local hospitals that I shouldn't have. Nobody knew in my family knew that we should be getting out of there and getting some more specialized. I spent time in hospitals that didn't know about skin grafting or didn't know how to do it properly. And uh, but but after about a month and a half, I ended up in the University of South Carolina hospital, and an old man that actually had invented the rule of nine for burns, where they where they figure out how bad you're burned. Right. And, First degree, uh, second degree, yeah, th that kind yeah, of thing. Yeah, Dr. Arts. He, right. he, he's one, and, and, and what part? The rule of nines divides your body into nine areas. Got and, you. And can tell what percentage. And, and he had invented that, and he pulled me through. And uh, 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 in fact, I was so bad off when they took me in there, uh, I think I only weighed about 105 or 6. I was down to almost nothing. And they weighed me and gave me every bit of the morphine they could give me, and then put me in a in a bath, uh, uh, antibiotic bath, whatever, and took brushes and just it was it was. I bet you it's brutal. Oh, that was it was it was brushing, as bad as the first minute. <laughs> so know, they were brushing skins coming off. Stiff in brushes. It wasn't little light brushes. brushes. They wanted that. In fact, yes, that's the day I started getting better though, because they took it down to good, good skin, good skin, and they started working from there. And now, had you been writing music prior to this? I wrote a song uh, or two. I had bands and stuff, and I wrote a song or two and even had a little recording uh, on, my, on a, my brother's band, but but no, not nothing real serious. I played a lot of music and love music. Are you left-handed or right-handed? I'm right-handed, yeah. Can I see your hand? Yeah. So I didn't realize that there was a finger missing. Yeah, that, uh, Dr. Allen uh, uh, became a good friend of mine, and he said, you know, this is going to be in your way, and it was way out here and turned down. He said, I can take it back in that joint. And I said, sure, I'll take it. I don't need can it. Can you move them? Oh, yeah, I can move these. This one I'll, sometimes kind of hangs up on still. i got to be careful. What about your thumb? thumb? Thumb is good. It just don't have any motion in the middle. Now, this finger, Haller, this little finger got right. burned. I don't know exactly why it got burned, but the rest of them were okay. But it was pulled down like that. And I said, I've got to have that straightened out. <laughs> I'm a guitar player. And you use that for minors and whatnot and, and diminished. And so I don't know how many times that I would be asleep and they'd be doing some other operation. They would, they would straighten that out while I was asleep and drive a pin down it. And, oh. But it got it to where I could finally. Well, you could do that. Yeah. I'll yeah. work on it. But, but I, it, to, to answer your question, it probably took 10 years of, of reconstructive surgery. It was in there six months before it was ever out. And then it was back and back and back in, in, to Carolina uh, until Dr. Arts uh, thought I ought to be closer to home. And he turned me over to a, a wonderful man named Dr. Lynch. He was head of plastic surgery at Vanderbilt. And uh, Dr. Lynch did the reconstructive. And, uh, uh, so, uh, but but it was around ten years of uh, wow. And, and, and I mean, I could have kept going, but I just got to the point. I said, you know what? I'm okay with it. And I don't care if, if somebody else is not. That's all right with me. You know, my wife was okay with it, and and uh, there's no end to plastic surgery. You can keep going. And uh, but uh, what a what a what a story. We we need to take a break. I, you you just inspired me in so many ways just then.
Um, Thank you, Helen. Um, by showing me your hands. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And, and I, I want to talk more about that in just a moment. Okay. This is Kim Williams. You're watching Anything is Possible. We'll be right back. Coming up. And it took me five years from the time that I made that decision in that psychology class to have my first hit, but it was the number one. This week, our home federal community spotlight is on Yoke Youth Ministries. Did you know that Yoke mentors more than 19,000 middle school students in our region? To learn more and see how you can get involved, visit yokeyouth.com. Play the hand you're dealt. That's it. And that's right, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, I, I, I've come to that conclusion. I, I wrote a song with Dean Dillon. He's another uh, East Tennessee native. And uh, we wrote a song called Play the Hand You're Dealt. And, and I mean, you can com uh, complain in life that, that uh, you're not a little prettier, or a little taller, or whatever, a little smarter. But uh, it, it's a lot more challenge just to take what you got and work with it. You know. You're watching Anything is Possible. My guest is Kim Williams, and, and thank you for, for showing me your hands. You're welcome. And, and you said that you've learned so much through, because is this what pushed you in the direction of songwriting? Is this, is this the thing that made you go, I got to do some, something else? Well, I, I, got, I got ready well enough to walk and carry on and get back. And I went back to the University of Tennessee. Uh, uh, well, to begin with, I went to Walter State, got a got an associate degree. And I took everything I always wanted to take. I went to school, out of, uh, I went to college out of high school, but uh, my parents said, you know, go where the money's at, go into this or go into that. And they wanted me to, go. daddy wanted me to go into electrical engineering. And uh, anyway, uh, I ended up going a year and quitting and then getting out into the trade business and uh, electronics and uh, so the second time I went back I took astronomy, archaeology, everything I wanted to take, just everything you dream you like to take instead of uh, all the other things a lot of people don't want to take and and then I, after that I thought well what am I going to do so I, I I thought about psychology I'd always been interested in it so so I went back to UT and started majoring in psychology with with the intent really of going into biological psychology because it had a lot to do with electronics and I was trained in electronics right. thought well those two will work and uh, but I was sitting in a class one morning and this is kind of an epiphany this is where it happened I was sitting in the UT class one morning I was a little bit early and three or four other kids were early here I am 30 some years old and these kids are you know 18 19 and they're talking about what field they're going into in psychology and I'd already taken a little class in Nashville. I'd, I'd, I'd stayed down there a while for the surgeries, and I'd taken a little songwriting class, and I knew I was interested in it. But in this in this psychology class, the the kids kept talking about what field they were going into, and it was all about money. And I thought, hmm, I've already walked through the shadow, and it's not about money, because <laughs> you know, mm. it's not about money. It can't be. There's got to be more to it than that. And and, and, and and while they were talking, I thought, well, what do you want to do, Williams? Do you really want to do uh, biofeedback psychology or, or, or physiological psychology, or do you want a songwriter? And I thought, I want a songwriter. I want to be a songwriter. So I didn't drop out. I finished that semester, which was only one semester away from getting a bachelor's degree. And I talked to my wife. She said, if that's what you want to do, we'll do it. And so I started driving to Nashville and once I finished that semester. And I, and I became a member of the Knoxville Songwriters yeah. here. And uh, Sarah Williams ran it then. And I just started working on it and studying it. It took me five years from the time that I made that decision in that psychology class to have my first hit, but it was the number one. And it's called "If the Devil Danced in Empty Pockets," <laughs> which we can all kind of uh, get that tale. You know, we've all had empty pockets. So uh, it was uh, that. But that that was a defining moment, and and uh, uh, it was it was almost, I guess, you could call it an epiphany. I mean, it, it felt like it. You know what I, I'd like to do is this has got to be a two-part interview. So, so, so you're going to have to sit with me, and ladies and gentlemen, we're going to go two parts on this because we haven't even gotten okay. into our stuff yet. Okay. But so, so that pushed you to standing. You said you walked through the shadow, 
I think yeah. that's what you said. Yeah. Walking through the shadow reconfigured your priorities and your definition of success. It, it, sure and it wasn't money. Yeah. But then you turn around and become a hit songwriter, and yeah. there's lots of money. Yeah. <laughs> Isn't that kind of... It, it, you didn't go chasing the money, but... I know what some royalty checks are like, kind of. It's, it's not it's, like like not like the ones that you've seen, but yeah. Whoa, They're, it's good. It, it's really good. It was a lot better before download, but <laughs> but yeah, it, it, it it's a, it's been great. Do and I really do. You ever talk about the biggest single check you ever got? Uh, uh, That's I'm thinking, I'm thinking, I, and I can't remember exactly. It wasn't quite one, one and a half million, but it was when I sold my first five-year catalog or, or the second five-year catalog. Can you imagine that? The, the publishing, you, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Can you imagine you get a check for a million, million and a half and just, yeah. and just a few Oh, I never back. thought I'd see that much money ever in my whole life. I mean, I, and, and if you think about it and go back and take what I was making, which is technician pay, wasn't bad, it's good. Uh, I wouldn't. Have, I wouldn't have made even a third of that for my whole life, probably, or at least not half of it. Let's and, pause right here, and here's okay. what I want to do. I want to dedicate uh, part two of this to what we learned, what okay. you learned, okay, uh, what you learned, what you love, what all of this has taught you, because this this difficulty delivered you to a place where you actually could bring joy to people. Yeah. yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, it does. We'll do that. Part two coming up. Kim Williams is my guest. We'll see you next week. We'll have on the same clothes, but we'll be right back.